गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन आप सबका रीजनल साइंस सेंटर भोपाल की ओर से राष्ट्रीय विज्ञान दिवस के खास मौके पर जब आप हम सब आज इस वीक लॉन्ग सेलिब्रेशन के अंतिम पड़ाव पर पहुंच गए हैं और आप सबको एक बार फिर से हमारी पूरी टीम की तरफ से हमारी काउंसिल की तरफ से राष्ट्रीय विज्ञान दिवस की बहुत बहुत शुभकामनाएं वी आर वेरी थैंकफुल टू ईच एंड एवरी वन and we really appreciate for your efforts and connecting with us we have students in our auditorium and also this program is being live streamed on our youtube channel so on this note once again we are happy to say happy national science day to all of you on this very auspicious occasion when we are celebrating one of the greatest contribution of indian origin our india's first physicist nobel laureate sir c v raman's contribution in the field of physics we have today a very special scientist human being and role model and a very visionary scientific leader and he is none other than dr john c mather i think most of you may be knowing about him because he has been associated with nasa's various projects and especially this james webb space telescope which is working at the age of frontiers in the field of science and technology this telescope itself a combination of a many many innovations and frontiers as far as technology is concerned so that is the real beauty that we have with us dr john c mather i want to tell about his contribution he started his scientific journey with nasa's godard space flight center and when he was working on this project so this project is not after the hubble actually it came into being for the discussion that what would be the next generation space telescopes so when hubble was launched during that era also people were talking about how we can take forward the scientific leap to the next level by designing developing and bringing a cutting edge space telescope for all humanity and that was the time from then onwards and very i think 1995 onwards dr john c mather was involved in that project he was working for his own scientific research for that he was awarded one of the prestigious i think i can definitely can say the highest regard in the field of science nobel prize and we i we are really honored that sir has given us a quality of time he is live from his house in the midnight almost midnight and that shows how scientific collaboration scientific awareness and taking science to people matters and that is why dr mather is going to talk about his own involvement his own experiences about the james webb space telescope and sir i would humbly request you uh, during your talk if you can also let us know about raman spectroscopy raman effect uses in the space applications which you have discussed with me as well so that would be great connect on this very important occasion we call national science day in the great contribution because of the great contribution of sir c v raman's work raman effect and now i want to tell one thing even even covid era when we all were facing a huge crisis across the globe but scientists engineers and policy makers were working like anything india has our own pride indian space research organization is doing phenomenal work we are also gearing up and working shoulders to shoulders with other space nations like nasa's america's nasa european space agency japan's jaxa and many more india's upcoming proud mission gaganyaan is also gearing up first human space flight missions under development very soon in a year or so an unknown man unmanned missions will be taken off and afterwards india's own space flight program with humans will be continued but this james webb why this uh, next generation telescope matters for all of us not because scientists and engineers are trying to understand about the universe its origin for generation galaxies for generation stars and also extra solar planets and many many things it also has huge potential to inspire our upcoming generation because of this marvelous technological achievement through this telescope sir uh, i can go on and on on and on about your work and contribution but this day is for you your contribution for the science 
and your personal experience. I would humbly request you one more thing, sir. These are the younger ones who are in our auditorium as of right now and also watching on our YouTube channels. Please also tell about your personal journey, being a student, how you have how you landed up in the field of science and your experience and how you see future globally. Because the theme of National Science Day India is global science for global well-being. So thank you, sir, for joining us, giving your quality of time. And now I would request you to please take your stage from here onwards. End of the talk, we'll take a few questions. We will ask our students, please share their questions with their names and classes. And I'll introduce you those students to you, and then we will continue. So, sir, now the stage is yours. Please, sir. Thank you. Sir, your mic is, I think, a mute. Sir, your mic. Hello. Sir, we can't hear you. So for all the viewers, we are trying to connect with sir I, because of Mike. Uh, okay. Um, yes, sir, please. Can you sir, hear me now? Yeah, much better. Sir, did you, did you hear us when I was introducing about the concept? Yes, I did. Thank you. Yeah, this yeah, is my microphone disconnect. Please go ahead, disconnect. Please go ahead sir. Yes, thank, thank you, you so sir. much. Um, I would like to tell you all the story of the universe and how we found out about it and a little bit of my own story. Uh, so thank you all for coming for this uh, amazing program. Uh, we are talk, you know, talking in honor of C.V. Raman, who, as you probably all know, uh, understood that uh, when light can scatter from a, an object, it doesn't always come back with the same uh, energy, the same weight wavelength, because sometimes the uh, scattered light receives or gives something to the object that it scatters off of. So... Uh, that was the basis of a huge amount of new research, especially with lasers, uh, where, which we now use as a tool to investigate uh, uh, chemistry and physics of ordinary things here in our daily lives. Um, and once in a while, we use it to uh, make lasers that will shine out into space and help us do uh, research out there. Anyway, it's turned out to be far more important than people ever guessed it would be. And of course, it's not something you usually would think of that uh, light doesn't scatter uh, and come back the same. So um, anyway, I want to show you the story of the Webb telescope. So here it is um, behind the uh, picture here, a great golden hexagon of uh, beryllium mirrors coated with gold to reflect the light of the distant universe into our equipment. Uh, this is an international project of three space agencies, uh, NASA, uh, the European and Canadian space agencies all working together. Um, it has taken about uh, 20,000 people to build this observatory and get it working. And it is available for all professional astronomers and students of astronomy. So uh, it's a, a tremendous technical success, as you know. Um, so why are we doing this? So these are questions that were on my mind when I was a small person, a young child, and some of them we're making a little bit of progress on. So where do human beings come from? Um, we see that we're different from the other creatures here on Earth. Uh, we're similar but different. Uh, how did the Earth come to exist? Uh, now that we are beginning to understand the history of the universe, we can begin to tell that story. Uh, are we the only uh, conscious or sentient or civilized or highly technical uh, people in the in the entire universe, or are there other civilizations, uh, living planets nearby? So if that's a possibility, then we'd like to know. Um, one of the great questions of science is still, 
Um, does the uh, formation of life uh, require an extremely unlikely coincidence, or is it something that will always happen given the correct conditions? So I call that a thermodynamic imperative. Of course, we all want to know, well, can we get off of planet Earth and go traveling through the universe? And the short version is, yes, we can go to the moon and we go to Mars and anything else is much more difficult. So that's about as far as we can say we can go today. Although we have had wonderful science fiction imagination to go to planets uh, in, around other stars for many, many years now. So um, the basic idea of modernist uh, science was already understood more than 2000 years ago. Uh, a Roman uh, poet wrote this in uh, somewhat uh, just more than 2000 years ago. Here it is translated into English. Um, they understood, uh, at least some of them did understand that there was uh, something that you call now an atom, that, that uh, objects that you see are made of tiny individ invisible particles. They're so small, you can't see them individually. Um, and that the way that they stick together into objects uh, makes them things that we see and use. So he wrote that no single thing abides, but all things flow, fragment to fragment clings, and thus the things do grow until we know and name them, and by degrees they melt and no, are no more the things we know. So a beautiful translation of ancient Latin. Anyway, uh, it captures a great deal of the philosophy of, uh, of science today. We need to know all of the details about these few, four few lines of poetry. So uh, to give you a little story about how I became a scientist, this is the place where I grew up in uh, Northern New Jersey. This is a farm uh, where people were studying cows uh, to learn how to get more and better milk. Um, and so, um, uh, under, understanding was that they have uh, genetics and uh, my father was studying genetics, uh, how to feed them better so that they would be happy and, and they would cooperate with us. So this is a great place to study science if you can do it by reading books. Uh, so my dad had a few things for me to read, but mostly I got uh, my education as a beginning scientist from the library because they, uh, small bus came around every two weeks with a, a library of books to borrow. So that was where I got my start. Um, and I went to public high school and uh, went then to college and studied physics and astronomy and mathematics. And I went on to UC University of California in Berkeley and looked for a thesis project. And it turned out the cosmic microwave background radiation had just been discovered and I tried to measure that for my thesis project. So uh, we'll now come back to in that story in a moment, but astronomers actually have a time machine that we use every day. Um, and of course you have it too. You see things as they were when light was sent to you, not as they are right now. Now the uh, speed of light is very high. So um, when you look at something here and nearby, we never notice the difference. But if you can look at uh, something very, very far away, you can begin to tell. So the nearest uh, other star besides the sun is about four light years away, center of our galaxy about 25,000 light years away. And the Big Bang, uh, when I wrote this chart, we thought it was about 15 billion years. Uh, now it's 13.8 uh, billion, so that wasn't too far off. So we look back in time, um, and we also now want to know how far we're looking so we need to survey the universe. Uh, this is our standard uh, basic method, uh, the top of something that you could have done with uh, technology we have 2000 years ago. At least you could have understood the method of drawing triangles and uh, calculating angles. Um, and the other method that we use is called this, the standard candle method. If I see two objects out there in the sky and I believe that they're actually identical, but one looks fainter than the other, we can use that to say, well, one is farther away. So now we can survey the universe and see how far away things are. Um, and we also now have the ability to see whether things are coming toward us or going away from us. So if you see uh, um, the sun uh, with your ordinary eye, you don't see anything but an ordinary rainbow um, of colors from red to blue. Um, 
uh, if you um, spread it out with a, a very good equipment, and then you see that there are dark bars across the spectrum of the sun that we call absorption lines that are due to particular atoms and the molecules occasionally in the surface of the sun. And so then now we can learn about the chemistry of the sun from studying these. A lovely surprise is that once in a while, uh, all of the wavelengths of light that we receive from a distant object are systematically shorter or longer than they would have been if those objects were here. So we say, well, this is due to the relative motion. A distant object going away from us uh, will send us light that has longer wavelengths because the waves don't arrive as frequently. So that gives something called the Doppler shift, and we can now use that to measure the velocities of distant objects. So uh, back in 1929, we had the very first uh, uh, graph that showed us that the universe is expanding. Each little dot on this graph uh, represents a galaxy. As you know, a galaxy is maybe 100 billion stars orbiting a common center held together by gravity. Uh, and the chart shows that, except for four very no nearby uh, galaxies, all of them are going away from us with a speed approximately proportional to distance. Uh, this means that if you divide the distance by the speed, you get the apparent age of the universe. The first time that we ever had any evidence that there even was an age of the universe. We now call this the Big Bang, uh, although we should just call it the expanding universe because the idea of the Big Bang uh, suggests something like a small firecracker, a small explosion, and we're actually trying to describe an infinite universe expanding into itself without any center or any edge. So it's not exactly a firecracker. At any rate, 1929, uh, almost, 200, almost 100 years ago, this was recognized, and that was quite a surprise for astronomers. Einstein did not believe it at first. So um, in Berkeley, when I was a graduate student, I tried to measure the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is the primordial heat radiation. When the universe was young, it was extremely hot and extremely dense. And the heat radiation from that time is still exists and fills the entire sky. So our job was to try to measure the spectrum of it to see if it was exactly as predicted from the expanding universe story. Um, now my thesis project actually failed to function properly. So I got a job at NASA thinking, well, I'll never do that, that's too hard. But then uh, NASA said, we want proposals for new satellite projects. And I told my new boss that, okay, well, my thesis project failed, but we should try it in outer space. He said, we will call up our friends and we'll write a proposal. And the miraculous, let's see, it was chosen and was eventually built and here it is, as we imagine it, in outer space. So it measured the spectrum, that is to say the color of this cosmic background radiation, which was the experiment I had done on my thesis project. Uh, and it confirmed that it, the prediction of the expanding universe story is exactly right. We also made a map, and I'll show you in a moment, that the sky is not equally bright in all directions. And that's also a prediction of the expanding universe and it explains why galaxies exist. If there, had no, if there were no spots, no in variations of the temperature of the material of the early universe, then the galaxies would never have grown and we would not be here. So here is a map that we made uh, and uh, the temperature of the sky is about 2.7 degrees Kelvin, um, just about as predicted by Ralph Alpher and Robert Herman in 1948. So, um, however, there are small variations uh, represented here on this map uh, that are about one part in 100,000 uh, brighter or fainter. So those are the spots that are responsible for our existence. Uh, we believe most of them are due to cosmic dark matter, uh, which has gravity but has no other effects that we know of. So that sort of explains the pattern. And now we say, well, how, what happens after that? Well, somehow the galaxies grew and, the, and all the planet stars were formed and the planets were formed. So now we'd like to know what happened after that. So here I am uh, receiving my diploma from the King of, of Sweden in, in 2006. 
and showing my graph showing that uh, Cosmos has the, exactly the, the current correct spectrum to match the expanding universe story. So by the way, uh, the, the money that I received was all spent on supporting students, some uh, physics students and some uh, dance students because my wife was a ballet teacher. So a combination of science and the arts. At any rate, uh, so that's part of my story. And so after that project was finished, I thought, what do I do now? And that led to my current work. By the way, uh, a lot of people describe the Big Bang as though it was everything compressed into a point. Of course, this is impossible because the universe has three dimensions of space and one of time, and a point has no dimensions whatever, so that could not possibly be right. So there's a, a longer version of my ex explanation you can read online at this particular website. So here is the great telescope that we built um, as I mentioned, it took 20,000 people to build it starting in 2005 when I joined the project. Um, it is uh, a project that is led by Goddard Space Flight Center just outside Washington, D.C. And uh, international partnership, as mentioned. As uh, Saket mentioned also to you, um, uh, future collaborations could involve uh, larger teams, including perhaps India which could contribute and because it already has tremendous capabilities in space missions and space science. At any rate, there is the picture of it. Uh, the the uh, telescope is, oops, um, telescope has this great golden mirror is uh, 6.5 meters across about 21 feet. Uh, and the, it is protected by this a big umbrella, which we call a sunshade. It's about as big as a tennis court. The telescope is very cold in outer space so that it does not emit its own infrared light so that we can use the telescope to measure infrared light. And it was launched from South America on Christmas morning of 2021 uh, on a European rocket, which they uh, contributed as part of the European partnership. So uh, we put it around a place called the Sun-Earth Lagrange point. It is uh, in the line between the sun or from the sun to the earth to this Lagrange point two. Uh, it's about 1.5 million kilometers from earth. So we put the telescope orbiting around that spot so that it always stays in about the same pl place for us. It's always overhead at midnight. So here is the scary movie of our telescope unfolding itself in outer space. It's all done by commands uh, sent up from below, uh, from the ground. Uh, first, we unfold the uh, solar panels because we use solar electricity to run the observatory. Then we unfolded the antenna to uh, communicate with Earth. Here we are now unfolding the uh, sunshade itself. and separating the telescope from the rest of the spacecraft so that it can be cold. Here we're unrolling some protective covers. You can see that this is extremely complex. It is uh, so complex that many people were very afraid that it would not work, um, but it did work because we worked really, really hard to make sure that it would. So after it's all unfolded, uh, it's not yet ready to be used as a telescope because it's not cold enough yet and it has not yet been focused. So after launch, it took us altogether six months to get it all ready for scientific operations. And we were so pleased that, it, um, that we did that because it works perfectly. So there it is in outer space a view, however, that no human will ever see. So now I'll talk a little bit about why we study infrared light. Uh, infrared uh, is different from visible light just in the wavelength, but it affects the uh, pictures that we can get quite dramatically. This is a picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope uh, showing a brand new star being born inside this cloud of gas and dust. And you can see there's an awful lot going on inside. Uh, and which uh, is hard to figure out because the uh, dust is opaque, cannot see through the dust. 
when you use infrared light, uh, you can begin to see through the dust cloud. So this here now we see that the star in the new star in the middle is sending out jets of material. And we don't know how that works yet, but it's very interesting and important for our story about how the stars are born, how the stars like the sun are born. Uh, we also use infrared because we can pick up information about objects that are too cool to emit their own uh, sunlight. Uh, so here is an object called a ring nebula. This is actually debris from a star that is in the process of, of burning out. So it sends out little puffs of material occasionally. And uh, they have this strange shape because we now believe there are five stars down there in the middle. They're causing all of this uh, interesting shapes. So someday we may understand the details and then we'll know exactly um, the pro physical processes that govern the formation of new stars and the death of old stars. Here's a beautiful example of a similar case where we were able to see a picture. Um, we now have a model of this story. There are two stars going around each other. Uh, every time they get close to each other, one of them sends out a puff of dust and gas, which goes outwards from the stars. And you see the image of it there on the left. Uh, the third reason we study infrared is that the universe is expanding. The distant objects appear to be going away from us at immense speeds. And here is a graphic illustration of that idea. Uh, distant galaxy going away from us and the light that we receive is redder and redder. Of course, the, we haven't quite gotten the, the graphic exactly right, but uh, that's what we're trying to say, that we can see that distant objects are redder than they would have been if the universe were not expanding. So here is the first image that President Joe Biden released on July 11th last year. Um, this is a picture of many things at once. Uh, there's a big bright star right there in the middle. Let me see if I can do this here. Uh, point at it. Oops. Right there in the middle, uh, we have a star. Uh, we see it's a star because it is so bright and it has what we call diffraction spikes sticking out those hexag the, uh, six pointed star there is due to the diffraction of light on the hexagonal mirrors. In the very center is an extremely large and dense galaxy uh, and then, uh, with several others that are like it. Uh, and around the, this central object, there are a number of very strange looking shapes uh, that are now thought to be uh, images of very much more distant objects and the images have been distorted by the, the, the gravitational effects of the light from that great galaxy in the middle. So uh, they are so distorted that they can be magnified and we can use this magnification to learn a great deal about those very first galaxies that are seen so far away and magnified by nature's lens here. Uh, here's an example of uh, one of those uh, galaxies that was very magnified uh, by, the, by nature's lens. And we see it on the right-hand side. It's called the sparkler galaxy because it's covered with these little globular clusters. A globular cluster is a kind of 100,000 star category. And so it looks like they're all falling in to this uh, great new galaxy. So it's something we don't understand yet, but it's very beautiful to look at and we hope to understand it. Uh, this is another uh, picture of galaxies. Uh, the, there are four or five galaxies in this picture. The one on the left is much closer than the other four. So this is so close you can see individual stars in this image. Here in the center, we have two galaxies that are in the process of merging together. And that's very important because when the, the galaxies merge together, the black holes will also merge as well. There's a black hole in each one, and uh, when they find each other, they will, uh, um, they will spiral in and eventually send out a great intense burst of radiation that's uh, very interesting to astronomers and uh, may, have, may have a great, great effect on the galaxies around it. The top one, the top galaxy here, is actually got a black hole in the middle. We call it an active galactic nucleus. And what it means is there is a black hole and there is uh, material falling into that black hole 
and get it heated up to extreme temperatures and the high pressures and high velocities. So it comes spitting out of that uh, uh, small object and it's very important to us. So here's another example of a beautiful picture. This is called the Cartwheel Galaxy because of the way that it looks. What we believe is that this small red galaxy in the upper left went flying directly through the center of this large galaxy. And what we're seeing is the splash. The, uh, it's like water splashing from a, a drinking fountain. Um, but the result of a galaxy passing through another galaxy is new stars are being born in this white ring. Oops, around the edge of the, oh, sorry. New stars are being born in this white ring around the edge of this galaxy. Now, this is another picture taken with the infrared to show you that galaxies are not what we thought they were. Um, this galaxy looks like a slice of a sponge with huge empty volumes in it. Uh, so these are thought to be the result of brand new stars being born. And then this, the new stars release so much energy all at once that it pushes the ordinary material that we see in the picture away. So we have a galaxy with holes in it. Here's a, a new version of a very famous uh, NASA picture called the Pillars of Creation. Uh, this is a place where stars are being born as we speak today. And uh, so the infrared capability is now uh, has changed us very dramatically in what we're able to do. We're now able to see inside this object to see the stars that are being born individually and to learn much more about them, how they're working. So this clearly shows that there's a very powerful wind blowing through outer space uh, and tearing apart the uh, cloud of gas that's there already. Here is a picture of a new star being born with planets, uh, we think. Um, right in the center is a star which you cannot really see uh, because it is image is being blocked by uh, a cloud of dusty material orbiting around it. And so that's why we can't see it, but we can see that the star is illuminating other things in the neighborhood. So this is part of our plan to understand how stars are able to be born with planets like Earth. We are definitely observing planets around other stars all the time. It's one of our major observing programs. Uh, we have two basic methods. One is to take a picture and see if you can see a little planet hovering near the star that it orbits around. Uh, very few planets can be seen with this method. So our other method is called the transit spectroscopy method. So if a planet ha just happens to orbit in such a way that it goes in front of the star, then what we see is that the star appears to blink. It'll be a little bit fainter for a while and then it'll get back to normal. And if we uh, watch this long enough, we can say, oh, well, it takes say 17 days to go around and we can calculate uh, what is the, the solar system up to then, of course, and also what is the earth doing? So that's uh, our process for studying the planets around other stars. Wait for them to go in front of their star and then spread out the light that we get from that star into a spectrum. So here's an example where we did that. This is a uh, star with a large, very bright planet. And we saw that it has signs of the chemical elements of sodium and potassium in its atmosphere. There's carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide and water and even sulfur dioxide in great abundance on this little satellite of Jupiter. So it's not so far off that you'll be able to hear much more about what's in Jupiter and how does it work. Here is Jupiter itself. Uh, the great red spot is no longer red. Uh, and that, that's because uh, we're using infrared filters and cameras. And so we have to invent a color to show you. What we usually do is we say, well, still, because it's, we, we can all remember it this way, the shorter wavelengths are blue, the long, longer wavelengths are red. So uh, that's that part. Uh, here, I want to show also that we have picked up satellites orbiting around Jupiter. 
one, two, there are several here. Uh, and there is a little trace of the, of the orbiting ring of dust that everyone knows of for Saturn. Here we see that Jupiter has a small ring of dust as well. Jupiter even has auroras over the northern and southern poles. We attacked an asteroid. We wanted to see if we could move an, a killer asteroid out of the way. So the answer is yes. Uh, this is a picture that was taken uh, with two different observatories. The Hubble telescope looked with it on the left and the Webb telescope looked at it on the right. And the discoveries um, do not actually very, make very much quant quantitative difference to our story about cookies and other things that you can make out of the chemical elements that were brought to Earth by asteroids. Anyway, we, we saw it and it was a tremendous technical accomplishment for our team because the target is actually moving very, very rapidly across the sky. So we looked at Titan. Uh, Titan is a satellite of Saturn. Uh, and it's interesting to us because uh, it's very cold and it has an atmosphere uh, that has lakes and, and has clouds and rain and weather and lakes and rivers of liquid hydrocarbons, uh, ethane and methane especially. So if you ask the question, is it logically possible for life to be based on some other system besides liquid water and carbon, then this is nature's biggest, biggest experiment. I don't know what we'll finally decide, but right now it's very tempting to think that this satellite has got interesting features that we should look at. So we will try. The, we are even landing a helicopter uh, we call it a quadcopter on the surface of Titan in about 2034. So not so far off, 11 years from now. Uh, here's a beautiful picture of uh, planet Neptune. Um, and it also has rings orbiting around it along with, in this picture, at least six little satellites. So that's a short summary of what we're working on with the Webb telescope. Uh, and of course, we publish everything as fast as we can. Uh, we have a presence on the social media and our websites. So you are very welcome to follow along with that. Um, I want to have a few more minutes. I want to show you what's next for astronomers. Because, of course, this Webb telescope took a long time to build and it's very powerful. Uh, but there are other things to do as well. So here is a picture of the next space telescope going up. It is um, Europe, uh, built in Europe. It's named after Euclid, who was a great uh, mathematician and uh, uh, founder, or at least uh, a writer about uh, teaching children geometry. Anyway, we've had that uh, telescope going up within a few months. And its object objective is to look for signs of cosmic dark energy and where might they be. So that's that's coming and it will uh, survey a great deal of the sky and uh, hopefully tell us something surprising. Uh, we are building this telescope on the ground in South America. It is named for Vera Rubin who was a great astronomer here in the Washington DC area. She studied uh, the dark matter herself and uh, was not uh, given a Nobel Prize for it, but maybe she should have been. At any rate, this telescope is very large. It's 8.4 meters in diameter. Um, the mirror is made out of a single giant piece of glass. And that's uh, possible because we can carry the telescope up the mountain on a truck. At any rate, the purpose of this one is to survey the entire sky every three nights and tell us when something changed. So this involves uh, lots of uh, comparison of multiple observations, but it's already beginning to work. So we know that there's a possibility of finding huge, huge surprises about the transient universe, the things that change from night to night. Uh, so we will also be flying this telescope. It's called the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope. Uh, it's uh, planned for uh, about four years from now. Um, and that's named for our chief astronomer at NASA headquarters for many years. 
It will also hunt for the dark matter and the dark energy and it'll do that better than ever before. But will also carry with it a little camera to, to measure this uh, emission from these objects, the cold objects way out there and planets way out there. Here on the ground, uh, we are already building these three giant telescopes, much bigger than anything we can put into space. Um, there are one on the top right is European and it's being built on the mountain in Chile in South America. It is 39 meters across, which is almost the width of a, a, a football field. Uh, the Americans are leading two uh, different telescope designs uh, one to go into South America and one to be built in Hawaii, if the plans all work out. So in a few years, the NASA astronomers, all astronomers will have some very powerful new tools to study the formation of stars, formation of planets, and the expansion of the universe. So among other things we're going to need is something called adaptive optics. So the atmosphere is turbulent, which means you can't get a sharp picture uh, taking through, uh, a good uh, image through a turbulent atmosphere. So the way that we have to do this is uh, to use something called adaptive optics, where we correct for the variable path length, the variable turbulence in the atmosphere with a device called adaptive optics. And if that works, then you can have something that's much, much, much more powerful than anything that we can build in, in space. Here's an example of a way that we could try to do that with an orbiting artificial star. We can put an, we found the orbit um, where we can put a, an, a satellite in space orbiting around the earth and have it appear to stop moving in front of a particular piece of sky so that we then can use that to focus our telescope on and make it work even better. So this is uh, something that's not so very difficult uh, and we know that we can do it. Um, something that's much more interesting and also much more difficult is to build an orbiting star shade. An orbiting star shade would cast a shadow of a distant star onto the telescope on the ground so you could look for the little planets near it. And the, the uh, simulated image on the right shows that in the one minute exposure we could very easily see signs of Venus, Earth, and Mars all in their places in this nice little picture. And that's possible because the telescopes on the ground are so large. So just to wrap up, uh, oh, I'm gonna skip over that. How far can you go? Um, well, uh, much farther than we used to think. Uh, a long time ago, the, the um, science fiction writers had space travel in their uh, plans, but nobody else really did. Um, now we can see that there are robots everywhere and they're getting smarter and uh, even beginning to have their own social lives. Uh, they can chat to us in English or other languages, I'm sure by now. Um, and so they are the creations that we could make that could actually go physically to other stars and back. And back. So thank you very much for coming. Um, I will be happy to have some questions with you. So I hope you were able to hear that well. Yeah. So. My goodness, I see many people sitting on the stage there. Welcome. So Saket, do we have some questions yet? Okay.
Hello, sir. Can you hear us? Yes. Oh, because of some yeah small glitch, uh, we were trying to set up. This is how technology works, and even in space, as you said, people were worried about the complexity involved in the project James Webb Space Telescope's deployment, and you beautifully explained and also showed us path about upcoming future in the field of astronomy, astrophysics, and uh, we have. You can say jam-packed auditorium. All seats are filled, and students are also sitting on dais and and in the age areas of auditorium. So you can experience the joy of engagement, joy of engagement, joy of engagement of science in all this upcoming generation of our India's future. And sir, uh, we'll take a few questions from this audience, and uh, uh, as per your permitted time because this is already post midnight for you. And yes, uh, a little bit, you are, yes. yeah. yeah, okay. So we are really honored that sir, you are sitting at the other side of the planet, more post midnight. This clearly shows how passionate you are and enthusiastic you are, sir. Not only as a scientist, but also as a, one of the great science communicator. Sir, uh, before starting our Q&A session, if you can relate us how Raman effect or Raman's discovery is really contributing in space through laser spectroscopy. And uh, you were mentioning me, if you can once again reiterate Raman's contribution, which is being used in the field of space program. Yes. Uh, so Raman showed that uh, when light bounces off of an object, it does not always come back the same, um, that it can add or re can have additional energy added to the photons or some energy subtracted. So this enables us to probe uh, the object that is adding or subtracting the energy. So we uh, then uh, can uh, study the solid state properties, the, the gaseous properties of, of materials and see how they interact with light. Um, this then gives us a new tool uh, we use to build lasers of all sorts uh, very powerful lasers that are called Raman lasers. And that's why we uh, uh, use them uh, to study things. So um, we don't usually use them uh, in space directly, but we use them to study things that we're going to use in space. So, okay, thank you. Yeah. So now we'll take a few questions uh, from our students. Yeah, yeah. please, Uncle Mike, please. please hand over the mic to him. Mike. Focus camera. Okay, I bully. Uh, please tell me your name. We which school? DPS Kola. We have a student from one of these schools from Bhopal known as DPS. And you are from which class? Seven standard. And what's your good name? Siddharth. The name of the student is Siddharth, seventh standard, uh, seventh grade, you can say, and from DPS Kolar. What is your question? Where is the center of galaxy? What is in, in the center of the galaxy? In the center of, yeah. Okay. So in the center of a galaxy is usually a black hole. Um, so uh, the Milky Way, the galaxy that we live in has a black hole in the center. Uh, it's a mass of several million times the mass of the sun. So that's what the galaxy has. Now, sometimes people ask what is the center of the universe? And as far as we know, there is no, uh, there is no center of the universe. It, it is, every part is as good as any other part. So that's a bit of a surprise for many people because people imagine that everything is rushing away from a center. But actually, um, there is no center of the universe that we know of. OK. He's saying thank you to you for answering his question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sir, I'm trying to be a bridging element because so that you can understand what he, people are asking. Anybody else from any other school? Yeah, 
take this hand, mic and hand over to the girl from Carmel Convent School, Bhail Bhopal. We have now girls, uh, girl student. Please mention your name, class, and question. Um, hello, my name is Sandy. I'm from so my question is, you talked about the function types in the summit. So does it sign also have function Can you repeat? Can you repeat your question once again? How can I talk about function types in the Ah, Diffraction. OK, diffraction in the stars. Can you repeat slowly? What is your question? Yeah. Bande Swapnil Mike. Dr. Martha talked about a fraction spikes. So, um, as Sir mentioned, uh, stars have fraction spikes. So, does stars, also the sun. Stars have fractions. Fraction spikes. Spikes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Fraction spike. Okay. So, if the sun also has fraction spikes, will it affect the visibility of a telescope? So did you hear? Not exactly, but uh, there's a fraction question about diffraction. Fraction spikes. So, whether our, our, our sun is also having the same, or if it is having, then whether it will affect visibility? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, Yes, the, uh, the, the uh, diffraction spikes, those six spikes that you see sticking out of every star, uh, do affect the visibility of uh, things that are behind those uh, spikes. So if we really are interested, we can rotate the telescope and the spikes will point in a different direction relative to the sky. So um, that's because um, the spikes come from the hexagons of the mirror. Right. Uh, I have one more question. If the universe is expanding, uh, then is the distance between the planets increasing as well? And uh, if the distance is also increasing, the Earth's moving closer to the sun or the other way around? So many couple questions. She's asking one more question. Uh, if the universe is expanding, then are planets also going far or expanding? That means in our solar system? Yeah. Ah, so a very good question, and uh, we measured to find out the answer to your question. The answer is no, the uh, solar system is not expanding, um, but uh, distant solar systems, distant galaxies are indeed going away from us. So this is a combination of small things are stuck in the pattern that they have, and but uh, when they're very far apart, they can s still go away. So. That's what we see. So distant galaxies are going away from us, but the size of the solar system is not changing. All right. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Yeah. From this audience here? Same. Same student you have asked already? Yeah, please go. Please hand over to him. Yeah, girls, student. Then come, we'll come to you. Yeah. So now chain reaction is getting started, sir. And uh, you can see in the auditorium, so many hands are rising, rising up here. Hello, sir. I'm from... Uh... Hello, sir. I'm from uh, Queen Mary Senior Secondary School. My name is Kritika Srivastava. And my question is, how do new stars born in galaxy? Ah. What's your name? Uh, my name is Kritika Shivasa. She is Kritika from which school? Queen Mary Senior Secondary. Queen Mary Senior Secondary School from Arbopal City. And I'm from asking... 11th grade. Okay, so she is asking... How do new stars born, born in galaxy? New stars. How new yeah, stars how are, are being born in our galaxy? Yes. Or you can relate to any galaxies. Yes. So uh, in our galaxy, uh, we have uh, one or two or three new ones every year. Uh, and so we don't really see them being born because they are born inside those beautiful glowing clouds of gas and dust. So we're just beginning to understand how that works uh, because in the past, it's all been completely hidden. 
uh, because we did not have the right tools to see inside those clouds. So we have now seen many thousands of new stars that are being born today. Uh, so in those clouds that we took pictures of. Okay. So I could also explain how is a star born? So a star is born when uh, gravitational forces are larger than the uh, gaseous pressure. So of course, uh, when you try to squeeze gas together, it gets warmer and it resists. Uh, but if gravity is enough, then it can continue to squeeze the gaseous material and make collapse into a star. So that's what, what happens every time a star is born. Gravity overcomes the force of gas pressure. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Sir, good. can you let, let us know uh, how many questions? Two or three? Because you are really it's very yes. late night for you. Yes, it is. Uh, one, one more, please. Okay. Now we have to choose. This one, this gentleman. Inko didi, inko inko inko. What do you say after this? Don't worry, we'll take your pictures and then we'll try to answer our questions. Loud and clear? So, first of all, a very heartily warm greeting, sir. Myself, Anamay Mishra, I'm from, I'm studying in class 9. I belong to Delhi Public School. So, my question is that what is black matter? Does it exist or not? Black matter. What is black matter? Yes, dark, dark matter. Dark matter or black matter? What is black matter? Does it exist or not? Yeah. Yes. Did uh, you hear, sir? Good question. Yes, I did. So the question is, what is it? And no one knows. Um, what we know about it is that it has gravity uh, and it is transparent. So we have never seen it. Uh, we have never seen any effect of it in a laboratory. All we have been able to see is that... Uh, uh, galaxies have too much gravity. And so um, how, why would they have that much gravity? Something else is in there besides the ordinary matter that you can see, the gas and the dust or the stars. And so we say, well, it must be dark matter. We call it dark, but we should just call it transparent because we can't see it. So something's out there, and that's all we know. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, due to time constraints, uh... Uh, now we need to wrap up this program. Uh, definitely, we'll take your questions and we'll try to answer and we will communicate to sir or then we will definitely come back to you. Because it's a post midnight, it's around almost 12.30 uh, uh, a.m. for him. So can you imagine how science is really infectious for across the globe? Thank you so much, sir, on behalf of Regional Science Center Bhopal. We are a unit of National Council of Science Museums, Ministry of Culture, Government of India. And uh, we are really thankful for giving your quality of time apart from your very busy schedule. And one thing you mentioned while you were talking about your prize money, of Nobel Prize money, how science and arts work together. You said some of the portion were given for physics or I can say science student and rest of the amount you have uh, given for art because of ma'am and uh, we pray to the almighty for her peace and happiness because ma'am is not anymore with us but she will be there with us like a star and illuminate us to take science and art together so thank you so much from india from bhopal and all from our school audience who are in the auditorium you can say see loudly they are clapping and also our youtube viewers I'm really, really sir, thankful, timing, and everything. I'm really thankful from bottom of my heart for your quality of time, sir. Take care of your health, and we will come to you. Any any message in the end, sir, you would like to convey to this upcoming generation, younger generation in the field of science and technology? Yes. One last thing, which is thank you for learning science and engineering, because the, you, this is the necessary thing for the survival of our planet. So you have very important work to do. So thank you for doing it. And thank you once again for joining and associated with us. Thank you so much, sir. Take care. Good night for you. Yeah. Good and good night. Good morning to you. <laughs> thank you, sir.